This is your reality check. Welcome to The Reality Check, the weekly Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. Today is April 24th, 2020, and it's just me, producer Pat. Today we have a really fun show for you, something we've been talking about doing for a long time and we're finally able to make happen. Christina and I had a discussion with two guests who I'm sure most checkers are familiar with, but we've never had them on the show together. Dr. Stuart Robbins is a research scientist who studies planetary geophysics, and Dr. Stuart Fairmond is a medical doctor turned science communicator and expert on food science. We talk about food, we talk about space, and we talk about food in space. I wanted to say a couple of things about this conversation. First, it's a little bit longer and a little bit looser than your typical TRC episode, but we thought it was interesting enough that we would just put the whole conversation out. The second has to do with a thought experiment towards the end of the show, where we talk about the moon being made of cheese. Yes, we had two pretty brilliant scientific minds on the show, and we talked about cheese moons. After recording, Stu Robbins let me know that he got some units messed up. He was doing math on the fly. The temperature on the moon actually only gets up to about 260 Fahrenheit or 130 Celsius rather than the 200 plus Celsius he mentions. This does change the smoke point discussion because most fats smoke at above 400 Fahrenheit. We decided to just leave it in because it was still a fun challenge and discussion, but we are aware that the numbers aren't correct. And as Stu said, the brightness of our cheese moon would change things anyways. And with that out of the way, I hope you enjoy our discussion with the two Stews. We'll talk to you soon. I'm very excited to welcome back to the Reality Check, Dr. Stuart Robbins. Hey, space junkies. And Dr. Stuart Pheromond. Hello, hello. They said it couldn't be done. They said if we tried to have you both on, a portal would open up <laughs> and the earth would be swallowed. But so far, so good. There's still time. Right. Well, let's keep our fingers crossed. We are super stoked to have both of you guys on. We've been talking about this forever. And as you know, you're our favorite guys. So The fifth and the sixth Beatle, for sure. Yeah, we've been uh, trying for a while to get this to work. And finally, we've uh, managed to get the time zones respectable so that we can all... Um, talk to each other in daylight hours. So this is very good. I'm very excited. Me too. So Stu Robbins, we've been in fairly regular touch with you and you seem to be holding up pretty well in this new world order that we're having. Dr. Fairmond, how are you holding up over there in the UK? Yeah, fine. I mean, most of my, my work's done from home anyway, so it's okay. And I can exercise indoors. I've got like a exercise bike thing set up and I'm in complete, uh, complete isolation because I received a letter from the UK government saying that I'm extremely vulnerable, uh, because I'm on chemotherapy for my, for my brain tumor which means that I'm to not have any face-to-face -face contact with anybody for 12 weeks. Um, and there's been one and a half million people across uh, the UK who, who've been sent these letters. And apparently we're going to be sent uh, food parcels and things to help us out because if we're not going to go out to the shops, which is, which is nice. I'm still waiting for a food parcel, though, so we'll see what happens. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm at home. And it would be really nice to sort of get out and go somewhere, but it's okay. You know, I kind of think about all the people who are in hospital working crazy shifts. I can't really complain about being stuck at home. Um, yeah, so all good. It's all good here. So how does that work, you doing chemotherapy without actually being able to go face to face with anyone? Fortunately, my chemotherapy is tablet based. Um, so I've just thankfully finished uh, the seventh round now. Uh, finished that yesterday. So, so it's round seven of 12. Um, so I did have to go along to hospital to have a blood test done and to have an MRI scan done, which is still very good. They had the results back a week afterwards. Essentially, they can't see any tumour there, which is brilliant. Um, better, And he said, you know, we can't expect to get anything we can't hope to get anything better than this so this is good well that is the best news i've heard in the last four to five weeks today. yeah it's fantastic isn't it um and so i went along and then they just couriered across my medicines um the ne the day after i i would have been going in there anyway so i had a telephone consultation and they said yeah everything's fine we'll send you your medicines out so that was fine so i just took my tablets and got on with it well, to be honest with you guys, I don't really have a format for the show today. I know that you guys have some questions for one another, and we have some questions for you guys as well. I think, Stu Robbins, this was your idea when you were staying with us last summer, wasn't it? I had heard that y'all were um, having an issue maybe with maybe having to go on hiatus for a few weeks, and 
uh, I had suggested you know, maybe some of the guests could get together and uh, do something together to take the load off. And uh, I had thought of this idea, and it didn't really go anywhere for, what, I guess, a year until now. Well, we all know Stuart as in Space Stew, is a foodie. You always bring us yummy things that you make when you come visit. Yeah, you do like my nuts. <laughs> uh, they're delicious. The, your nuts are the best. Well, now, Space Stew, since this was your idea, can you start us off with a question for Dr. Fairmont? Uh Sure. Actually, I think I'm going to go towards uh, the last question I had. Uh, something a little bit more practical today, or these days, is you know, in these trying times, a lot of people are trying to buy in bulk and freeze food so they don't have to go out uh, so that they can let uh, healthcare workers do their thing and let elderly people not be as exposed as, uh, as they can. And so I guess my question is, what are general rules of thumb for the type of food that can and can't be frozen well? So for example, uh, butter can be pretty easily frozen for months, but fresh lettuce can't. Um, can sour cream, can yogurt, can any of these other kinds of things be frozen? I guess what are, I was really going for was, is there maybe a general rule of thumb based on maybe water content or fat content or protein or anything like that, that people could go to as opposed to a giant list of things? That's a great question. Basically, most things can be frozen. If you go with the general rules of thumb, if you, if you assume you can probably freeze it, then you probably can. Most dairy things you can freeze. Most things that have been cooked, you can freeze. Most meats that you can freeze. Uh, fish, similarly, you can freeze. Now, interestingly, um, fish does a lot better frozen than meat does. And that's, so you've got to think about when you freeze something, all the water inside it turns into ice and it turns into basically ice crystals. And these are very sharp. Uh, and so fish muscles, fish muscle cells, they're quite flexible. When the, the water inside them turns to ice, it expands and becomes sharp and spiky. But because their uh, muscles are very kind of flexible and they're used to being in very cold water, uh, they don't get pierced. They don't, they don't break. Whereas if you get some very good quality meat and you freeze it, then sometimes the, the, the sharp icy sort of crystals will actually damage the uh, the the internal of the of the muscle cells so that when you cook it it won't be quite as tender things that aren't good for freezing like lettuce and that's simply because they've got loads of water in it's essentially just a water bottle lettuce is so it's mostly water and you can imagine all those plant cells uh, when the water inside them turns into these sharp crystals they all get punctured Water expands as it freezes, and so all these cells expand and they basically pop. So when you when you uh, thaw it, you've essentially all the all the structure's been lost, and it turns into just a a floppy green horribleness. It's lost all its structure. Some berries will do this. Uh, very delicate berries. You can put them in. The, you can you can freeze them, and uh, similar sort of things happen. They come up very mushy. Uh, so essentially, uh, meat and fish is good. The other thing to bear in mind is that when we freeze at home, it's never as good as when it's free frozen before we buy it. Because our freezers uh, freeze quite slowly, uh, as it, the slower it freezes, uh, the more time that the, the crystals have to form and essentially the sharper they become. So a bit like how you might see a uh like a snowflake forming when you see those those um time lapse videos similar sort of thing happens is if you give a very long time uh for water to freeze it kind of the 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 spiky bits kind of all kind of expand uh and it sort of grows very big and so the slower that you freeze something the more damage you're going to have to it um, so which is why fish, if you freeze it at home when you get it straight away, it's probably never going to be as good as if you bought it frozen from the shop because they will, after it's been caught, they will typically just throw it straight in the freezer on the ship. It's frozen to minus 20 very, very quickly, whereas in your uh, freezer at home, uh, you probably don't even get it down to minus 20 by a long way. And then you it takes a long time. So even when you've frozen it, um, Often when, if you get it out a day or two later, the very inside of that, of that, of that portion may well actually not be completely frozen yet, just because our freezers at home are pretty puny. So I actually have an outdoor freezer in addition to the indoor one, and the outdoor one is much colder than the indoor one. Like I was making ice cream yesterday and the custard, uh, got down to freezing in an hour and a half as opposed to four hours in my normal freezer. So are you saying, for example, that 
if I want to freeze food, I should be using that outdoor freezer because it gets stuff a lot colder, a lot faster. Yeah, absolutely. The faster you can freeze it, the better. That's always the rule of thumb for, for pretty everything. The, the, the faster, the better. The, the, the faster, the smaller the ice crystals, the less damage it's done to the internal structure of whatever it is that you're freezing. And then because dairy doesn't really have a structure, except maybe cheeses perhaps, uh, but like milk, for example, or yogurt doesn't really have that structure. It doesn't have the cell walls to worry about. That's why they freeze well? No, absolutely. You're right. They don't have an internal structure, so they're fine, yeah. So we could freeze sour cream? Well, I've read that you can't, that it doesn't freeze very well. But I don't, I've never tried it myself, but so I don't see why not. Most dairy products, they, they will freeze okay. Um, they might separate uh, as they freeze, but basically when you thaw them, just, just mix them and it should be fine. We'll do an experiment, Stuart. We'll, uh, Stuart and Stuart, we'll do one. We'll put a bit of sour cream in... Uh... Tupperware thing and freeze it, see what happens. All right, let's let's switch gears. Food stew to ask space stew a question. Um, I've heard recently that there's been some legislation passed about space mining. That's right in the in the US. And my question to you is: Is um, this going to be something that we'll see in our lifetime? So will we? Uh, will there be an Elon Musk? Do you think that will go to an asteroid or to the moon and mine some stuff? and bring it back. So that's the kind of the first part of it. Uh, and the second part is, is this a good thing? Is space mining in general good for us, good for humanity? Uh, do you think it's a good thing to do for us to go to places to mine it of the, of the raw materials and to bring it back to Earth for use or not? Yeah, so this is a complicated question because it gets into uh, politics and law besides just technology and resource usage. Uh, so if we try to push politics and law aside, which you can't do, um, it becomes a question of, is it more economical to get a resource that we need elsewhere than on Earth? And so for something that, for example, might be useful that's buried deep in Earth's mantle, uh, but you might be able to find on the surface of an asteroid, then of course, it's always going to be more economical to go to that asteroid and bring it back. But if you have, for example, iron on the surface of an asteroid, but you have so much iron on the surface of Earth, it is not economical to go to an asteroid to bring it back, just because getting off of our planet takes a lot of energy, and potentially getting off of that resource to bring that resource back takes a lot of energy. There's this thing called the rocket equation, which... Every uh, physics student learns somewhat early on. It's basically, it's a, it's a fun differential equation uh, for all of you math people out there. But basically, it's if you're driving in a car, you have a situation where the amount of fuel that you have is not a significant portion of the weight of the car. So you will get very, very slightly better fuel economy when you're close to empty than you will when you have a full tank, simply because your car weighs a tiny, tiny bit less. But with a rocket, you have a situation where your fuel is the vast majority of your weight. And as you expend most of that fuel in the first few minutes of just trying to get off of Earth, you get rid of most of your weight. And so you become a lot more fuel efficient as you go away from Earth. But if you have to bring more fuel with you, as uh, listeners might remember from a few weeks ago when I talked about getting to Pluto, you have to bring even more fuel to get it off the planet in the first place. And that costs a lot of money. And so if you can't recoup your costs in the amount of material that you are mining and bringing back, you're never going to do it unless it's something to set a record. So to be the first person to bring a piece of whatever back from whatever object, that might be a thing. But after that, unless we find a real economic way to do it, uh, and it makes economic sense, it's simply not going to happen. Now, there are, as I said, ways that it could be economically feasible. So for example, if a uh, jewelry company were to find out that there was an asteroid made of solid gold, uh, then they might try really, really hard to figure out some way to bring that back to Earth because uh, then it could be quite useful. Now, of course, then you have an issue of if you have a giant resource of gold suddenly available, is that going to crash the gold market? 
And so you have a lot of different things at play. So getting back to your question of, are we ever going to see this in our lifetime? Um, it's possible. <laughs> but I wouldn't necessarily hold my breath is, is kind of what I'm getting to. Now, that aside, you also have uh, something called the Outer Space Treaty. And the Outer Space Treaty effectively effectively says that governments cannot declare that uh, uh, anything in outer space basically belongs to them. And people who sell naming rights to the moon or Mars or Uranus or whatever, they try to get around this. Uh, they, they try to say that there's a loophole here where you can say, hey, uh, it says governments can't own this, but private people can. The problem is, is that you have to have effectively a government to say, we recognize this claim and we defend this claim. Otherwise, uh, you just have effectively, almost literally, a Wild West situation of just people going in and staking claims to this and other people taking it and you have no legal recourse. And so it gets to a really thorny issue there of space law, uh, which I am not a lawyer or for those in England, I'm not a barrister. Um, I don't know any of this stuff really beyond uh, really the letter and what I've been told and what I've sort of learned about it over the years. As I said, a lot of issues come into play with this, and I'm not really sure if we'll see it in our lifetime. It would be interesting, as Christina said, but yeah, I wouldn't hold my breath. Do you have a personal opinion, though? Do you, do you have any kind of moral sort of feeling one way or the other? Um, so, I mean, I'm asking the question of... We, most of us have a have a general sort of gut feeling that we shouldn't um, pillage the earth and destroy it for for just our short term gain, and I guess the argument could be said for you know we kind of most of us see that there's a there's an inherent beauty or uh, value in the earth uh, as as in its natural or least damaged form, whether whether that's kind of sentimental of me or not. I don't know, but do you think that uh, the same should you'd have that we'd have the same attitude towards more like Mars? Are we right just to go and sort of mine it till we've got everything out of it? I mean, just of your personal opinion, what do you think? I agree with you in terms of planets, but what about uh, I'll flip this around a little bit. What about a two meter wide asteroid that's just floating about there and is literally just a chunk of rock, uh, and there are billions or more of them will you have the same sentiment yeah i mean personally i i mean i'm not bothered about floating chunks of rock so much um <laughs> so yeah I, I yeah do we care as much about the deserts as we care about the rainforests no we don't um but i guess essentially uh, it's all, is it all the same do we do we should we should we treasure uh the universe i mean it's a that's a I guess it's a, that's just a personal opinion, isn't it? We're never all going to, going to agree on that. Right. Well, and the most likely thing that we would mine first are these small couple meter sized chunks of rock because uh, those are the easiest to get to and they have effectively no gravity. And so you don't have to waste fuel uh, getting off of that object as opposed to Mars or the moon. You have to bring fuel there likely at least with present day technology, uh, in order to get that material back to Earth. And so these are questions that folks are going to have to answer. Um, and personally for me, uh, I don't really care about the meter-sized chunk of rock. I say, let's bring it down and use it if we can. All right, Astro Stu, do you have another one for food, Stu? I, ha I have many. I have a question about gravity. Is there anything about cooking that actually requires gravity? other than the basics of keeping your food in a cooking vessel or on your plate or anything like that. So what if we had terraformed an environment on the moon? Um, would things cook differently? Clearly, in a terraformed environment, it would be like Earth. But again, you would have, at least on the moon, one-sixth of our surface gravity, or on Mars, one-third of our surface gravity, or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. It does make a big difference. So, I mean, think about a flame, for example. Uh, a flame goes up. Uh, but there is no up when you when you don't have gravity, so you wouldn't get the heat traveling up, for example. So that causes a problem. The other thing is that when you so the same way is that you boil something on a stove, you get uh, you get what's called a convection current, which is the hot liquid at the bottom rises to the top based on uh, on the difference in, in the density. 
it rises to the top uh, and then you get this and then as it cools it goes back down again and you get this this circular motion of of uh, of liquid and that's very important for the for the how how we cook obviously you see it when when something boils you see the bubbles come to the top um so so you won't get that and there are some videos actually if you go um online you can find them on youtube of what what, what boiling water looks like in microgravity it's very strange so rather than the bubbles going up you just basically get one sort of rippling bubble where the water um touches the the heating elements it just sort of uh, bubbles around there but the bubbles never go anywhere it's just a sort of this this sphere rippling sphere of water vapor so yeah so that's one thing that's going to happen um with the with the lack of gravity so you won't have flames and you won't get sort of any kind of convection current happening in any of your sort of liquid uh foods so that's gonna be very difficult um to do anything like that would leavening behave differently? So, for example, would I get super duper lift on my pancakes? <laughs> yeah, I would have thought so. Absolutely. Yeah, I would have thought you would do. So the gravity, you kind of got to think of how much of the weight of the of whatever it is that you're you're rising uh, affects on gravity, and how much is on the um, the air pressure itself. I think yes. If the gravity is less, then a big weighty. Um, cake or something um what is weighty on earth that will rise a lot more so yes i would expect that your pancakes would be a lot more fluffy um because the leavening agent will uh, still be effective um and so it will rise a lot more so yeah, absolutely you will get fluffy pancakes on the moon so better souffle in space <laughs> better <laughs> souffle in space it's just space souffle you would need to probably change the leavening if you wanted it to be uh, similar to that on earth and so the flavor could change because some leavenings like uh i think it's it's baking soda that has almost a, a slightly metallic taste if you use too much of it so the flavor would also change a little bit just based on the ingredient yeah, absolutely, change. Absolutely, yeah. You tw- I mean, baking, as you know, is a is very much a is very much a science. It's a sort of you get the recipe right and then you don't tweak it too much. Uh, whereas other kind of cooking, you got to be you can be a lot m- less precise. So yeah, um, you know, even on Earth, uh, when you go to different altitudes, that can very much affect uh, the how things, the speed at which um, things cook and how they dry out. So yeah, absolutely. So the gravity will affect how much things rise. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I live at 2K uh, elevation, so it's it's always fun trying to adapt or adapt recipes. And actually, I have a related question, if we can go directly into that. How would popcorn work on a different pressure? Mars, for example, has uh, 0.1% of Earth's atmospheric pressure. It's so low that water, if you let it, if you put out a glass of water on the surface, it would almost immediately boil away. How would that affect something like popcorn where you have to have, um, as you explained many episodes ago, you have to have uh, almost that huge pressure differential because you're, well, I'll let you explain how it works. Yeah, so popcorn is a type of corn and uh, the thing that's quite special about it is that the, the outer hull, which encases the kind of the starchy core and the germ is particularly hard you can get any kind of corn and you can pop it but popcorn is uh is just particularly uh well shielded so that when it pops it does so very kind of violently and with popcorn when you heat it uh the the moisture inside gets hotter and it gets hotter and essentially it cooks the starch on the inside but it, it's all kind of contains like a pressure cooker inside this little uh, sealed hull. And it will eventually burst, but it bursts when it gets to essentially nine times atmospheric pressure. That's the point at which it overcomes this super hard encasing. And it literally bursts open at that point. And it, that, it gets to, it's about 180 degrees C, at which point it gets that, which it gets to that pressure, bursts open and this super hot, uh, starch, which has gone on to like a gooey sort of cooked soft state as it expands, uh, it cools very rapidly because when something expands quickly, it cools down in the same way that you spray an aerosol, you notice it comes out very cold. And that's just by virtue of the fact that, uh, something very compressed is expanding very suddenly. Uh, it gets very, it cools down quite a lot. So you get the same thing happen. And so it, as it balloons up, it goes, 
uh, I think up to 50 times, um, 40, 50 times its, its original volume, um, as, as this soft cooked starch sets very, very rapidly as, as it, as it expands. Um, so that's what happens with popcorn. Now the question is, is that if you put it into a very low pressure environment, well, let's call it a vacuum. Is that going to be enough of a pressure differential between the inside and the outside to make it pop? The answer is no, it's not. You can put them into a, into a vacuum chamber and, and popping corn does not pop. If you heat it, it will pop a lot faster than it would do and it will go a bit bigger than it would do in normal atmospheric, uh, pressure. Uh, but no, uh, it won't just pop on its own. You'll just, uh, it'll pop faster and it'll pop bigger. So in other words, I need to get on that moon base in order to make my pancakes a lot fluffier. <laughs> And get my popcorn a lot bigger. You got it, yeah. And they'll they'll fly a long way when they pop. Better make sure we got the lid on the top. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I have a question for Stuart Robbins, if I can. Last week, Stuart, I uh, I tuned into your discussion with uh, Dr. Pamela Gay on uh, Cosmo Quest Twitch Hangout. Yeah, well done, by the way. And you were talking about some work that you're doing uh, with data from the Mars Global Surveyor. So we'd probably want to have you on the show just to talk about that at some point. But one thing you said was that Mars has weather and you showed an image which appears to have clouds. So my question is, would those clouds be like the clouds on Earth containing like water and ice or would they be made of something else? Yeah. So not speaking as an atmospheric scientist, um, I will say yes, but it's a qualified yes in case um, I actually do some research on this and find out the answer is no. Uh, But Mars does have water. (laughs) <laughs> so, I love that kind of answer. Yeah. Um, no, it, it does have H2O. Um, you know, it's a lot of people think that Mars is very, very dry, and it is. It's a lot drier than Earth. It has a lot less water. It's lost most of its water, uh, but it does still have water ice, and that ice can uh, sublimate, so it can turn directly from a solid to a gas, and it can then condense in the upper Martian atmosphere and form clouds. And uh, you had sent me this question in advance. Sorry, listeners, we don't do all of this spur of of the moment. You sent this to me in advance, and I was actually looking at a humidifier that I have in the house. And it's spewing out a very, very little bit of water at a time, and yet I can still see the water that it's spewing out. And so you actually don't necessarily need a lot of water or a high density of water to make something uh, opaque or to make it at least uh, dark enough, or I guess in the case of clouds, bright enough to affect the camera sensors that you can actually see them. So you don't actually need a lot of water to be able to do it. But yeah, I mean, it, it's similar to uh, clouds on Earth. Oh, interesting. So would that go for the, the frost line? The, the picture also showed a frost line that would be water as well, or ice, I guess, as well? Yeah, so um, that was seasonal frost. And I think that that is mostly water ice, but it is probably also a little bit of uh, what we call on Earth dry ice or frozen carbon dioxide. We call it dry ice because at Earth's atmospheric pressure, carbon dioxide does not exist in a liquid form. And so it can only go between a solid or a gas. And it's the same on Mars. Uh, It does not exist in a liquid form, so it will condense out of the atmosphere and turn from a gas into a solid, what we call dry ice, and then it can sublimate away, turn directly from a solid to a gas. And again, that's why it's called dry, because it does not have a liquid phase at our atmospheric pressure. Interesting. Uh, Space G, you've actually answered um, the reason why you get freezer burn. Ooh. Ah, yes. So, yeah, you've described sublimation, which is going from a solid to a gas, and that is exactly what happens on your chicken that, that, that hasn't been wrapped up properly in your freezer, and you get those hard bits on it, which we call freezer burn. That is just that the solid uh, water, the ice, has turned into a gas because you've not, it's, it's vaporized because you haven't wrapped it enough, and it ends up getting very hard, and it's actually dried out. So that's what freezer burn is. Christina, do you have one for food, Stu? Oh, I do. I have one for you, Stuart, about strawberries. I know fresh produce seems like a a bit of a... uh, Pipe dream? Yeah, right now. I was going to say holy grail, 
Anyways, I wanted to ask you about berries. I love strawberries and it seems like two days after I get them home, they're ruined. But I have a Tupperware thing that helps extend the life now. But my girlfriend, Trisha, sent me this article and she's like, you have to ask your food science friend. So is there a secret to longer lasting berries if you dunk them in a hot water bath. This food scientist, Harold McGee, says that if you do this, which is called thermotherapy, you could actually prolong the life of your strawberries. Yes, uh, Harold McGee is absolutely right. He is a top food scientist. He's got a great book called On Food and Cooking. Very, very good if you want to do a deep dive on any kind of uh, food sciencey type stuff. After you've bought my book, of, of course. course. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. What he's describing is you're killing the enzymes. If you get generally fruit, uh, vegetable produce to above about 50 degrees C. So I think in this article, he describes uh, a slightly above 50 degrees C. I think it's about 52 degrees C for about 30 seconds. That's enough time for the, the heat to get far enough into the, the berry so that the enzymes, enzymes are uh, essentially chemicals that are designed to speed up reactions or rather they they perform a particular job they're like little kind of chemical machines and many of the enzymes in fruit and vegetable are designed as to protect them so an apple goes brown for example because there's a browning enzyme when you cut an apple it goes brown because there's a browning enzyme and that's its natural response to if it's been damaged it makes itself go brown and mushy so that so the insects and predators don't want to eat it anymore uh so it's its own defense mechanism and all kind of fruits have this essentially a defense against sort of insect infestation uh they got this kind of this browning reaction and so this is what's happening in the berry it's the thing that makes it go mushy so if you if you what, what do you call it thermotherapy or something mm-hmm. um if you if you if you blanch it basically if you blanch it you uh you deactivate permanently deactivate many of these enzymes and so uh, it will age it will it much more slowly and so it's as long as you don't cook it because if you cook it, then you'll break down the internal structure of the of the fruit and it and it will go mushy. So if you blanch it for about 30 seconds, hot water, you could use a, a thermometer, a cooking thermometer to get it to about 50 degrees C. Um, and then I would say put cold water over it afterwards so you don't cook it and put it into the freezer. Or you could just put it in the fridge right. and, um, and then it's going to last you for longer. Yes. So food stew, do you have one last one for Astro Stew? Yeah, so um, I don't just do about food science. I do lots of other sort of bits of science communication stuff. And I find, I don't know if you're the same, that you've got a very short window of time to uh, engage somebody who isn't inclined towards sciencey type stuff. And so you need to catch their attention uh, quickly. So if you have to tell somebody uh, why they should be interested in planetary astrophysics sort of stuff what do you tell them without resorting to uh, aliens and kind of impossible sort of star trek type things what would you how would you how would you do that what's your what's your go-to way of saying you should listen to to this kind of this field of science because it's it's interesting it's relevant if we want to know how things act on earth we need to understand how they act in different places, different environments, and different conditions. And those conditions are only afforded on other bodies in the solar system. And so only by studying how things act in extremes can we better understand how they act overall, and so can we better understand how our Earth acts when stressed or pressured under different circumstances. There are so many different ways to answer your question, and there and and the answer is that it it varies entirely depending on each individual person. Uh, so if you're talking to an environmentalist, then I think the answer that I gave is important. If you're talking to someone and just trying to justify the space program in general, I think the answer that I gave is a f- is probably the fastest way to answer the question. Uh, Technology is almost a secondary thing, but it's entirely true. So we have to, for example, uh, we have to be able to harden any hardware against radiation. 
And we have to be able to do that because there's a lot more radiation in space than there is on Earth's surface because we have effectively shields up with uh, radiation belts and other things in Earth's magnetic field. And so uh, that is one technology that had to be developed for the space age. And because of that, we have better radiation shielding for everything else uh, in a practical sense on Earth. Uh, The same thing goes for just the ability to machine things to a certain precision that you have to have to send a laboratory in space that's going to be operational 25 years later. That ability to machine things to such a, a good tolerance and precision and accuracy, all of those words which actually mean different things but all are meaningful and important for this application, All of those things came from the space program. Uh, You also have, for example, thermocouples for fuel sources for uh, RTGs, radiothermal generators. That was required for the space age to be able to send a probe basically beyond Jupiter where you can't use solar power anymore. And even solar power, uh, that was developed by accident on Earth, but uh, almost as soon as it was developed, they were like, let's develop this further for satellites because satellites basically carried batteries that lasted a few days. And it was only with the development of the solar cell that satellites could become an independent uh, thing, effectively, where they had their own independent power source that they could uh, use in order to stay functional more than a few days. Uh, and of course, there's Tang. That's important too. Uh, But all of these things uh, came from the space age and are required for space, but have technology trickle-down effects on Earth. But as I said, I I wrote a completely different answer to your question when I originally thought of it, because I was thinking more, um, what if I had a piece of equipment with me? And the answer to your question then of what gets people engaged, I think, is seeing Saturn. So I, uh, as a graduate student in most astronomy programs, if your school has telescopes, you are required to host an open house for the telescopes. Um, I actually did it about half the time. I did it more than any other graduate student when I was there because I really liked the telescopes and I liked public engagement. And without a doubt, the primary thing that got the most positive reactions from people were seeing Saturn's rings for the very first time in a telescope, where half of them looked at it and thought that they were painted on. Like we had put a picture of Saturn in the telescope, and they were looking at a picture. It's like, no, that's that's real. <laughs> no. Our son was pretty impressed when him and his buddy, when we took him yeah. to that event um, at the like Ontario a, a Science. Party or yeah, it, that, it's it is pretty impressive. Yeah, well, and I think the fact that people go to these sky watching parties, I think people still have an innate sense of wonder and interest in the universe. But, you know, we still have to sometimes justify the money to study it. But as I said, it, it totally depends on the person. So I gave a talk, uh, I guess, two months ago to a group of 11 and 12 year olds in a school uh, that's uh, roughly grade or year six students. Uh, I had 15 slides, and every single slide except for two was just a picture or an animation because people like those pictures or animations. I mean, the Hubble Space Telescope was responsible for a period of time for a very large percentage of all of NASA's public outreach because the pictures were just so neat, and people like that. Uh, Now that we have 3D printing, a lot of museums are going to uh, 3D printing surfaces of other worlds that people can actually feel it and look at it um, and look at craters and stuff like that. Basically, you want to engage people's senses. Now, with food, uh, you have it easy. (laughs) I mean... uh, Mm. Yeah, you do. Everybody likes food. It's easy. (laughs) Everybody except the breatharians consumes food. (laughs) So, well, and, and they, they do too. They just don't tell anyone. Uh, so, but you can do all of that with food. With astronomy, it's much harder to do that. And I think anything that you can do to engage people's senses is a good way to uh, engage with them. But again, everybody acts differently. So for me, when I was an undergrad, I actually was able to touch a piece of an Apollo lunar sample. Uh, now, this was literally something that was brought in in a locked suitcase with handcuffs, <laughs> because these samples are so valuable, they are brought in and under this kind of security. But being able to actually 
hold a piece of the moon in my hand and be like, this came from a different body. And all of that it represented in that and also just all that it represented in terms of the ability to bring it back to Earth, for me, that was a, an, an emotional moment, I think. Uh, but not everyone has the same th- kind of reaction. So I did the same thing when I taught a lab class as a grad student. I handed out meteorite and everyone was holding it. And I saw the same reaction that I had felt in maybe a quarter of them. But you know, 75% were just like, eh, it's a rock. Who cares? And so I think that you do have to find different ways to engage different people. And uh, I think that you have to have a large tool set from which to sample and be able to sample quickly. Because as you said, you have just a very brief period of time to make that kind of impression, Uh, especially, at least in my case, if it's a policymaker uh, or the taxpayer who's funding my research, I have to somehow very, very quickly try to justify uh, why 50 cents out of every $100 of their tax money goes to the space program, at least in the U.S. To your point, Stuart, about um, you were talking about images, and there is a website I came across a couple weeks ago uh, that has Hubble images, and you can search by your birthday. So you I literally actually... just saw an article about that this morning. <laughs> <laughs> really, I it was really fun. I went and I checked my birthday, and uh, it was just a really neat little thing to and to engage you. And then I checked Pat's and and uh, our sons, and it was. I thought that was really. I think that's what you're talking about, right? Any any way to sort of in, like lure people in, right? Well, and and again, I think with with food. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's easier. I mean, you even have websites that are like food. Oh yeah, porn. much easier. Much easier. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, so what was it that got you uh, engaged? Um, my story is a lot less romantic than <laughs> you might think. Um, for me, astronomy was just sort of an interest, um, more of a hobby. And in 1997, in the dark ages when Al Gore was just finishing inventing the internet, we had um, a, what was it? a competition, a website design competition, basically, for... Um, middle school and high school students. And I participated in that. I made a website called Journey Through the Galaxy. It's actually still up. It is ridiculously out of date. Um, (laughs) But uh, it was sort of in designing that that I was like, oh, this is kind of neat. But then I was like, there's no money in it. I'm going to go into electrical engineering because I like that science experiment we did when I was in fifth grade where we made an electrode and we made a battery and that was fun. Uh, and then I decided that that was too hard. And so halfway through my senior year of high school, I was just like, well, let's see. What else is there? Well, I've always liked astronomy. Let's do that. And I guess I'll turn that around. What got you interested in food science? Uh, I fell in love with kind of science communication to begin with. Uh, and that was from teaching. And it was seeing those penny drop moments of, uh, you know, teenagers uh Generally, teenage girls who hated science. Um, and my, I took it upon myself to show them that, uh, science, and particularly at the time it was, uh, biology and health science that I was, um, teaching them, um, to show them that it wasn't this, uh, dull, dry thing that they'd been shown when they were at school, that it was something that was, that was actually kind of quite beautiful and, and really kind of awe inspiring and showed you, you know, made you understand the world in a much richer way. And when you see those penny dropping moments of people saying, Oh, I get that now. It's just kind of magic. And that kind of made me fall in love with, um, science communication, science writing. And from that, I sort of f- found, formed a niche in, uh, in food science. And partly is that because it's a really good way to engage people in a whole range of different sciences. Um, so yeah, I just sort of fell into food science off the back of, um, of general sort of science communication. Sounds like um, Astro Stew and Food Science Stew need their own podcast, maybe. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we do. And then you guys maybe can have do. us on. <laughs> All right. So the last question we have, it's actually several questions for both of you. Darren was thinking about if the moon was actually made of cheese. So first, Astro Stew, what would happen to its shape, gravity, location, movement, effect on Earth, et cetera? Yeah, this is actually an SAT question. <laughs> on the physics SAT. Really? Um, 
Well, sort of. It's what if the sun were to turn to a black hole, what would happen to Earth? Uh, the answer is is nothing, uh, except uh, in terms of gravity. So there are a lot of different ways to answer this question. Darren was uh, not that specific in the way he posed it. My question to Darren would be, uh, would it keep the same density or not? So if it would not keep the same density you have a lot of weird things happening. So if it were to keep the same density as moon rock is, which is about three times higher than cheese, um, then the answer is much simpler. Um, So cheese has a a density of very roughly one. It's actually hard to find this online, Um, but it's very roughly one. And that's because cheese is basically water, fat, and protein. Water, is defined as a density of one, one gram per cubic centimeter. Uh, Fat is lighter, less dense than water, but protein is more dense than water. And so it all averages out to roughly one, depending on what cheese you're talking about. So cheese is about three times less dense than the moon. Uh, So if it were to keep its density, it would be a super dense cheese, uh, and nothing would really be different gravitationally. Its structure and mass would be the same, and it would try to contract, but we've already said that this is a magical, incompressible, very dense cheese. Uh, Now, if it could collapse, um, if it, for example, had the same density, but we made this no longer an incompressible cheese, then it would definitely collapse because it weighs a ton. Actually, the moon weighs about 7 times 10 to the 19th tons, which is 70 exatons, which is 70 giga giga tons. Uh, So because it weighs so much, it would compress. And just like if you were to take a piece of cheese and stick it under a diamond anvil, it would differentiate. So it would separate out. I'm not really sure what fat would do when exposed to a vacuum. I think that posh stew is going to answer that question. So the fat would rise to the top because it's least dense. It would be exposed to the vacuum something would or wouldn't happen. Um, If the liquid in the cheese were exposed to the vacuum, then it would boil away practically instantly, and you would be left with whatever the fat did uh, and a bunch of very, very high-density coagulated protein, which under that weight would almost certainly break down. Uh, Now, if it were to keep its size, but if it were to go down to the density of cheese, uh, then we start to act differently gravitationally. Uh, So it would move farther away from Earth. We would have fewer tides. Our obliquity would change. It would be more chaotic. That's uh, Earth's axial tilt because the moon does generally help to stabilize that. And lots of weird gravitational things would happen just with a less uh, gravitationally large source in near-Earth orbit. But other than that, yeah, nothing nothing real, real interesting, at least from a space point of view. All right, food stew, you're up. Is the sun going to cook it? Is it going to melt? And what happens to fat when exposed to the vacuum of space? Yeah, I don't know what exactly what happens to fat. You see, I've only really looked at um, cheese on a, in an earthly sort of realm because um, and it depends on the type of cheese that you have as well as to what will happen with whether it melts or not. Um, and a lot of that is to do with how well mature the cheese is, what, how much moisture is in the cheese, and so how tightly the uh, the proteins are bound together. Now, you're telling me that uh, all the proteins... Uh, would do something strange because of the because of the gravity of this cheese moon. Is that right? Right. So I mean, when something weighs so much, it differentiates, which means that the heavy parts go to the center and the light parts go to the outside. It's like putting it into uh, a centrifuge. And then when you're down in the center, uh, just because of gravity pushing on you, you also are going to heat up a lot. So you're going to cook those proteins, um, and they're going to get to such a high temperature that they would easily denature. But again, the lighter stuff, the fat would be at the top. Um, and I don't know what happens to fat when exposed to space. We need to, we need to do an experiment. We need to find, uh, find somebody who can put some, it's dairy fat, put some dairy fat into space and see what happens. <laughs> um, but essentially, um, normally cheese would melt uh, at about um, 50 to 60 degrees C or about 150 degrees Fahrenheit, that sort of temperature. And that depends on the pH of the cheese, um, which 
uh, directly affects how tightly the, the proteins are bound together. So if you manage to have your cheese on the surface that was still of cheesy format, uh, then it would, it would vary on, uh, on the type of cheese that you had. And I imagine in space, what's the surface temperature of the, of our cheesy moon gonna be, uh, Dr. Stu? Yeah, well, um, I would have to actually do the maths on this one, um, because the brightness would be different. So uh, bodies in space are a certain temperature because of a lot of different factors, but one of the main ones is how much energy they reflect back into space. And the moon is actually really dark. It reflects only about 10% of the light that it receives, uh, whereas cheese, uh, depending on the type, obviously, uh, so like the feta cheese I have in my refrigerator, it's probably closer to about 80 to 90%, whereas uh, a darker cheese like cheddar might be 50 to 60 percent uh the the dark bacteria areas of a blue cheese would be closer to 30 percent so because it reflects more light uh it would be cooler uh but i can tell you that the present day daytime temperature surface of the moon is i think is maybe 250 celsius 200 250 celsius something like that and so you're telling me that we're probably looking at 200 degrees c plus on our cheesy moon, if I've got that right. In some areas. Now, of course, on the backside, we're looking at closer to uh, well below freezing. Okay, so if we've got um, our fats, and will we, will we have our, our water on the surface as well, or just the fat on the surface? Just the fat, unless the fat goes away, because the fat is going to be a lot lighter than water. Okay, so in, just in terms of temperature and fat, is at that temperature, the fat is probably going to be above its what's called smoke point and so the fat will burn so the fat on the surface of your cheesy moon will burn away so that will be what happened on on the sunny side of the moon or this or the side of the yeah the side of the moon when it is exposed to the sun and i guess on the other side uh depending on how cold it gets your fat will uh possibly remain solid or maybe i don't know would it's a possibility that the surface uh, cheesy fat and moistureness could turn into a, a cheesy atmosphere. Is that gonna, is that gonna happen? <laughs> is, is the gravity of our cheese moon enough to hold a cheese atmosphere? Probably not because the moon can't hold Probably an atmosphere not. now. <laughs> um, but cheesy vapors. Yeah. It, actually, so maybe, maybe this does answer the question. So if you're saying it's above the smoke point, um, so it would uh, effectively smoke away and you would get a temporary exosphere. Uh, that's where the gas molecules act not as uh, a gas, but they, they just sort of are in free trajectories. And so you would have a temporary exosphere of smoked out Gouda fat, I guess. I don't know. Because you would lose your fat over a period of time to be determined, uh, you would be left with then the water, which would definitely go away. And so over time, all you would be left with would be uh, the remnants of that protein in the center. The temperatures and pressures inside of a planetary body are enormous. I mean, it, it keeps rock molten, which is well above the temperature at which protein will break down. So I guess we're going to end up just with a carbon core at the end of it, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, eventually. What, is, what a sad fate. <laughs> that's pretty boring <laughs> but it would be really interesting uh the process as it goes because you would go from i i'm envisioning a an icy lard like outer surface on the far side <laughs> that is effectively turning into a melty sloshy fatty ocean that's burning <laughs> away and smoking away on the near side uh, or the day side. <laughs> with, with, with a temporary cheesy atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, with a temporary cheesy atmosphere or exosphere. And then suddenly when we lose that monolayer left of fat, <laughs> we suddenly get water, which would practically instantaneously, I mean, over the course, it depends on how much water is there. Uh, but it would very, very would quickly. We have oceans for a while. Yeah, but very quickly go away. And then you'd be left with, with that... Uh, with that core of protein, or whatever's left, the, I guess the building blocks of the amino acids. Gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for your time. <laughs> <laughs> what a thought experiment. So this was actually a ton of fun. I would like to do this again if you guys are both game. Oh, I would love to do yeah, this. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Look forward to it. 
Thank you very much for your time, guys. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TRC underscore podcast. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome back to the Reality Check, Dr. Stuart Robbins. Am I supposed to say something? (laughs) (laughs) 